This week, we're going to look at it in a slightly different way. We're going to look at it about today, how our minds need to be filled uh, with the Word of God, with um, the work of the Spirit, um, and how it affects our minds. And we're going to use some examples in this letter um, to Ephesus here um, to understand how um, to renew our minds and what aspects do we find in this letter that can help us um, today. So we're going to use this as a bit of an example, a kind of um, a basis for, for thoughts around this topic. Um, so hopefully by the end of it, we will understand how the, uh, the, um, the ecclesia at Ephesus was exhorted to have minds that were full of the Spirit, and uh, we can learn some lessons for our own walk. Now let's just have a look at some background first of all. So we're looking um, in this letter to the Ephesians. Uh, but the, the church in Ephesus, this ecclesia in Ephesus, um, was, uh, was uh, and we, we, we first of all read of it, um, I think in Acts 19, we see Paul goes and, and, and delivers the, the message to, to the Ephesians. And it becomes um, a key ecclesia in, in Asia, um, and it's mentioned again in, in Revelation. And what we're reading here is a letter that was delivered to that ecclesia in around about AD 63 to, well, about AD 60 to 63. And it coincides with a number of other letters. Uh, so um, letters that Paul wrote when he was in prison in Rome. Um, so the Ephesians, Colossians, Philemon, and um, the Philippians, the Philippians and Philemon were obviously to, um, um, to those in Philippi and obviously Colossians and Ephesus. So, that, so we have a number of different ecclesias that were receiving letters from Paul when he was um, in prison. And in this letter in Ephesians, we see um, the spirit being full um, within, within, these, um, within these chapters. It's full of aspects of, of the Spirit. Even from the very first chapter, we read that, that poem um, um, that starts verse 3 and ends verse 14, and it talks about, um, it blessed us with uh, all with um, spiritual blessings um, in heavenly places in Christ. That's how the, how the letter opens, and it closes by looking at the spiritual armour that they needed to put on. And so all these different aspects of the Spirit that we'll, we'll consider a few of them um, this evening, God willing. So what about this, this letter, um, some more background um, to this letter. So early manuscripts of this letter um, omit the, the, the two Ephesus. And it's thought that as a result of that, um, it's because it was a circular letter. Now we know that there was circular letters, uh, they went from ecclesia to ecclesia. If you look in Colossians 4, uh, verse 16, you see that the Laodicean ecclesia had to take their letter and give it to um, the Colossians and vice versa. So there were, there were letters that were circulated around. They would have been pertinent to the ecclesia that they were written to, but also it was useful for them that, to be transferred um, to other ecclesias. And as a result of that, I think we don't have like a personal greeting or a greeting to particular um, people within this ecclesia. But what we do have is a very nicely structured message that could have been used by multiple ecclesias. Here we have it um, to the Ephesians, um, and, and the, the Ephesians would have received this and potentially have passed this letter on um, to, to other ecclesias. So it's almost nice to think that potentially you could replace the Ephesians here with the, those at rugby, the Ecclesia at rugby, and it would be, be, we'd be able to read it in that context and to understand some of the lessons that were being uh, put forward to the Ephesian Ecclesia. Now, the structure of the letter is um, very important. So there's six chapters, and then partway through uh, we have almost like a split and we have a, uh, first of all, the first part of this, this, this letter is all about um, the gospel, remembering the gospel, um, remembering this message of hope, remembering the redemption that's been, um, uh, been made for those believers, to remember the grace of God, to praise God. Uh, so it's almost like the theory behind the gospel. 
And then it ends in the end of chapter 3 with the word Amen. So if you look at the end of chapter 3, there's the word Amen. And then there's the word therefore at the beginning of chapter 4. And when there's a therefore, that's like it's an inflection point. It's like something's changing here. There's going to be something different, going to be a different aspect. And the therefore is because of the things that we've spoken about before, you're now, um, you need, now need to behave like this. And so the last part of, of the Ephesians is all about how they should behave, how they um, are exhorted to, to respond to this message, to respond to the message that's presented in the first three uh, chapters. And so in those first three chapters, you have this um, explanation of the spiritual blessings. You have um, the, uh, how that they, have been, they were dead in trespasses and sins in chapter 2 um, and, uh, and talking about the grace uh, in, in chapter 3. So, and then it leads them into, okay, now you need to behave like this. And the hymn that we had was the introduction to that, which is oneness, one body, unity. Uh, is one of the first exhortations uh, that is presented as a result of the, the, the gospel being reminded to them. Now, the topic we have is, is spirit, um, and it's part of this series. So, first of all, let's just um, identify kind of where this idea crops up uh, within, within this, this, this letter to the Ephesians. So it appears in every chapter, in some way, uh, this idea of the spirit. In this first chapter, we have... Um, this very important kind of um, um, statement at the beginning around spiritual blessings in heavenly places. That section ends with being sealed with the Holy Spirit. Again, very important for what we're going to talk about today. And this spirit of wisdom is also mentioned there. So it's about giving them this wisdom, giving them blessings, giving this people uh, blessings that, and reminding them that they have received something pretty amazing um, and the thing that they have received is spiritual. It's not of this world. This is something different. This is something unique. Chapter 2 then goes on and it talks about um, the, the purpose going from um, it, it, um, being in sin to in Christ. So this is transition that happens. Um, and it talks about heavenly places again in, in uh, verse 6 of that. And it talks about going from this spirit, the sons of disobedience in verse 2, to being um, one spirit to the Father and dwelling in, um, uh, having, being a dwelling place by the Spirit. So this building up, up, up of a temple um, into this dwelling place through the Spirit. So there's this, um, this, this action of the Spirit here. Uh, we then have chapter 3 which is um, then the revealing of, of the mystery in Christ, which is revealed by the Spirit. So we've got this, the Word of God reveals who Jesus is to the, all those that were, were listening. Um, and along with that, the gospel uh, message, this hope and grace that, that's um, identified. Chapter 4, we then have the therefore statement, and, and then the imperative to then act and do something. So unity of the spirit in the bond of peace, one body, one spirit, one hope, being renewed in the spirit of your mind, which is our topic, and then the spirit of God, ye are sealed. So there's that idea of being sealed again um, in chapter 4. And then verse uh, chapter 5 is when we have the examples of behavior put side by side. So the examples of of um, the flesh, so being drunk um, and taking in wine and being drunk, and then the opposite of that is being full of the spirit. So there's this, this um, these two things are put uh, side by side as examples of of the flesh and spiritual thinking, and then we uh, conclude with um, the spiritual armor, so the armor, the whole armor of God. Um, and as part of that, we have the sword of the Spirit. And then it explains what the sword of the Spirit is. If you were in any doubt as to what the sword of the Spirit was, it explains that it is the Word of God. And so we have an explanation that this Spirit that's been talked about is linked with the Word of God. It's the message of God. And at this point, we're wielding it. So we've gone all the way from understanding that there's spiritual blessings in Christ in chapter 1 to using that Spirit um, in the last chapter. So now you've got to go and do something with that spirit, um, that, um, 
that message, that word of God, and you use it to go and preach to those around. So there's actually two things that we're asked to do in that last chapter. We're asked to pray, pray um, in the Spirit, and the sword of the Spirit, which is obviously going out and preaching. So we've gone from receiving the Spirit, spirit word in the first chapter and then acting and getting into this state of action um, in the last chapter. So let's um, first of all consider the mind. Let's consider the mind. So that's part of the, the topic uh, that, that we're looking at. It's this idea of, of the mind and how the mind is altered uh, by the application of, of the spirit and how, um, how this works. Okay. So the word, the word spirit that we see here, and actually um, spiritual blessings is linked to this word as well. It's the word pneuma. Um, as we would know, those who are students of, of language will know a lot more about um, the Greek than I will. Um, but if you, if you look the word up and kind of how it's used, um, yes, it means breath and it means to breathe in. And we get this idea, don't we, linked with inspiration and breathing in. Uh, we get a links with creation and breathing into the nostrils in order to give life. Um, we get uh, th those ideas. But also um, it, it, it speaks of, of the rational mind and it speaks of the mental disposition. And I think that's quite an interesting uh, way of thinking about it, particularly the verse that we're looking at here, which is to renew the spirit of your mind. So if you think about what's going, washing through your mind, being breathed into your mind, um, it's talking about renewing the mental disposition that you have, filling your mind with something which is not, um, which is not normal, which is, wasn't, wasn't um, normally there. It wasn't naturally um, in your mind. So let's have a look at some examples of that. And then what we're going to do is we're going to structure the rest of what we're uh, um, um, doing around, first of all, looking at the mind and looking at how the mind is altered by the spirit. That's the first thing we're going to do. And then we're going to look at three aspects that we, that we see in um, the book of Ephesians or this, this letter, which um, shows us the effects of that, the changes to us as a result of that. So first of all, we'll look at the change in the mind and then three aspects uh, of, of our lives, uh, how it changes our behaviour. So that's the structure. So let's, first of all, have a look at the chapter that we have as our, as our keynote, uh, which is um, uh, chapter 5, uh, sorry, chapter 4 and verse 23. That's, that's the verse that we have as our title, to uh, be renewed in the spirit of your mind. Okay, so, so where does this argument all start? Where does this verse sit? Because it sits in a context, um, and the context starts in verse um, 14, sorry, 17, verse 17. Uh, this I say, therefore, testify in the Lord that ye henceforth walk not as other Gentiles walk in the vanity of their mind. So we, we've already we've got a mind mentioned here, and this is an empty mind. This is a, 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 the mind that is full of vanity. So this word vanity means emptiness or use, uselessness. Um, so vanity of their mind. Verse 18, having the understanding darkened, being alienated from the life of God um, through the ignorance that is in them because of their blindness of their heart, who being past feeling have given them themselves over unto lasciviousness, to work all uncleanness with greediness, but ye have not so learned Christ. So now we see a change. Okay. So let's just have a look at that. This is idea of being alienated from the life of, of, of um, the life of God, and we have this coming out in chapter two. This idea of no longer being alien, but be belonging somewhere. So now, so this is chapter 2, verse 19. Now, therefore, ye are no more strangers and foreigners, um, but fellow citizens with the, with, uh, with the saints and of the household um, of God. So it's this idea of no longer being separated from these things, but actually fellow citizens in the household of God. So this natural state, this state of Gentiles that was being dealt with here, there would have been a lot of Gentiles in, in Ephesus, um, they were coming from this 
um, natural state of darkness and being separated and alienated from the life of God. But they've learned something. Now remember we learned about wisdom, didn't we, in that first chapter. There was this wisdom that was, um, was, was given and that wisdom was filling their minds and it was changing the, the, way, the way that they thought. This was in, um, the, in verse 17 of chapter 1. Um, uh, the uh, God of our Lord Jesus Christ, the Father of glory, may give unto you the spirit of wisdom and revelation in the knowledge of him. So something's been revealed. A light's gone on um, in their brain. They've just received um, this, this lightness. But, at, but ye have not also learned Christ, verse, uh, back in chapter 4, verse 21 now. Um, if so be that ye have heard him and have been taught by him as the truth um, is in Jesus, that ye put off concerning the former conversation, the old man, which is corrupt according to the deceitful lusts, and be renewed in the spirit of your mind, and that ye may put on the new man, which after God is created in righteousness and true holiness. And so you get this um, idea of going from one state of darkness, alienation, to being um, having the truth, having light, um, and all of these, the, 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 having the mind renewed. And there's this word created. There's this idea of creation. Something uh, has changed in the mind. Something has changed in the mind. We'll come on to that um, in a moment. Now, we have kind of the two sides put um, side by side here, the vanity and darkness, and then we have the renewed righteousness and holy are the aspects um, of these two sides of the mind, the flesh and the spirit um, side that we see put very starkly within, within this um, letter. And there's the two sets of actions, and there's a couple of these. If you read through, there's two sides to how each, each side um, would act. So in verse 28 it says, Let him that stole steal no more, but rather let him labour, working with his hands, the things which is good. And so we have behaviour which is changed as a result of the mind. And that's really the, the whole idea of, of this letter to the Ephesians. We've given you this thing. We've changed your mind. We've put your mind into a completely different place. Now go and do something about it. Go and actually change um, the way um, that you behave, the way that you treat others. Uh, so I talked about um, this idea of, of creation, and this, it comes out of, out of um, verse 24 here. Put on the new man, which after God is created in righteousness and true holiness. So there's this idea of creation, and, and this links, doesn't it, with the, 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 um, an aspect of the spirit, this breathing, so breathing into the nostrils and bringing forth, bringing forth um, life. Now we see some other um, links here as well. Uh, we won't go into that one too much, but let's go to, um, let's go to um, a couple of verses which parallel this idea in, in Ephesians really strongly. So in Psalm... Uh, 51, we have some very similar um, aspects being brought out. So Psalm 51. And if we go in, let's put both of those on. Yeah. Um, we go in at the first verse, we see that this links with putting off of the old man, that aspect in Ephesians of putting off the old man. Um, and so picking up through the spirit here the, the um, elements of the life of David and using it to make this point, which is a point that then was, would be um, you know, pertinent even to the Ephesians and, and to ourselves. So verse 1, Have mercy upon me, O God, according to thy loving kindness, this idea of grace, which we'll see in a moment, according uh, unto the multitude of thy tender mercies, blot out my transgressions, wash me, um, truly from my iniquity and cleanse me from my sin. It's this idea of, of the sins being forgotten, being cleaned. This is like Ephesians 2, isn't it? Um, for I, have, uh, I acknowledge my transgression and my sin is ever before thee. Against thee, thee only have I sinned and done this evil in thy sight. And thou mightest be justified and thou mightest speak and, clear, uh, when, when, uh, and be clear when thou judgest. Behold, um, I was shapen in iniquity, and did sin, 
and in sin did my mother conceive me. There's this idea of the old man, the old man, and, and, and putting it before God and asking to be cleansed. Purge me with hyssop, etc. Make me whiter than snow. And then we see um, in, in verses, um, verses 9 and 10, we see putting on the new man. This is now the effect that links with, with um, the verse that we're considering, verse 23 of Ephesians 4. Hide my face from my, from my sins, verse, verse 9, and blot out all mine iniquities. Create in me a clean heart, O God, and renew a right spirit within me. Renew a right spirit within me. Cast not away from thy present uh, cast me not away from thy presence so bring them to god there's this idea of not being alienated but being brought to god into this household cast me not away from thy presence and take not thy holy spirit from me restore unto me the joy of salvation and uphold me uh, with thy free spirit and so we have very similar ideas don't we here in in um psalm 51 to the letter that was sent um, to the Ephesians. And again, it's not a unique um, uh, um, message in Scripture that we see this in, in, in Psalm, we see it um, here in, in Ephesians, but we also see it in Corinthians, we see it here in Romans 8. And in Romans 8, we see there's a huge section here that talks about the, f- the spirit and the flesh, and they're put side by side, and they're, 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 they are um, two ways of living. Two ways of living which have been put side by side. So in verse, verse 3, um, For what the law could not do um, in that it was weak through the flesh, God sending his own son in the likeness of sinful flesh, and for sin condemned him in the flesh, that the righteousness of the law might be fulfilled in us, who walk not after the flesh, but after spirit. After the spirit. What does that mean? Walking after the spirit. It means a complete change in outlook, doesn't it? So, again, it's the same idea that comes out of this letter to the Ephesians. So you're no longer walking after the flesh, but after the spirit. It's a different outlook on life. It's a different way to to, to think. Uh, For they that are after the flesh do mind the things of the flesh, but those that are after the spirit, the things of the spirit. It's a different mind. It's a different way of thinking. For to be carnally minded is death, but to be spiritually minded is life and peace. And so therefore we have the same idea, don't we? We have the same idea um, here in Romans 8 that we do in in Ephesians. This idea of having a different outlook on life based on the fact that you've received this message of truth. You've received this spirit word, however it was whether it was the comforter going and speaking in tongues and and telling them what the Spirit was, or for us, we have the the Scriptures, and we sit here and we read the Scriptures, and these Spirit words go into our minds, and they change the way that we think. They change the way that they think. Right, so let's now, as a result of our changed minds, we've all been through this this process, changed minds, we've had the Spirit word um, and speaking to us and revealing um, the mysteries of Christ, mysteries in Christ, and we know the gospel. Now we have three things that come out of this letter to the Ephesians, which um, is an effect of that on us. The first one is this idea of being sealed. So I'll have a quick look at what does it mean when it mentions this this idea of being sealed. The second one is um, something to do with heavenlies, heavenly places. What on earth does that mean? Again, we could do an entire Bible class on that, but we'll just mention what it, what it um, means here in, in Ephesians briefly. And then finally, we'll look at this idea of being filled. And each of these three aspects are linked with this idea of having a changed mind. And there are three effects uh, that, that happen to those that have been through this process of of a mind changed or a mind that's been renewed. So we come across this first one, this idea of being sealed, we come across it twice. We come across it in chapter 1, and we see it um, in verse 13, and it says, Ye are sealed with the Holy Spirit of promise. 
And so the Holy Spirit of promise, um, it links, doesn't it, with Acts chapter 1 and the fact that they were promised this, this spirit, uh, this comforter that you probably learned about last week. Um, and then that gift happened, didn't it, in chapter 2? Um, it happened. We'll have a look at that um, very briefly in, in, in a moment. Uh, but we also see it in the chapter 4 that we saw. Um, let's see if I can find it. In chapter 4, it talks about not grieving um, that, yeah, here we go, verse 30. Grieve not the Holy Spirit of God, whereby ye are sealed. It's this idea of being sealed by the Holy Spirit. Now, this first one, it comes in, this, um, in, this, in the poem that we read um, as an introduction. The poem is a single, I believe, again, those of you who are, who are um, sort of uh, students of the text will, will let me know whether this is wrong or not. But there is a sentence, of, uh, like a, a full sentence that flows from verse 3 to verse 14. And there's, there's no, no there's, it's, a, it's a single sentence, and it's like it's presented as a poem. And it's punctuated by three um, sets of praising God. So if you look at verse 6, at the beginning of verse 6, it says, to the praise uh, of the glory of his grace. So first of all, it talks about praising the glory of his grace. In verse 12, it said, He that um, should be to the praise of his glory, who first trusted in Christ. And then the final one is at the end of verse 14, unto the praise of his glory. So this ceiling fits into that structure. It fits into this poem that starts at verse 3 and runs to, to verse 14, punctuated by these, <clears throat> these three praises. And these three praises um, link, uh, link with grace, trust or hope, and the glory to God. So that, that's, the kind, that's the flow that you get. And you get a very similar idea that comes out in, in Romans um, 5. And in Romans 5 it says, Therefore being justified by, uh, by faith, we have, um, the peace, we have the peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ, by whom you have access by faith into his grace, wherein we stand and rejoice in hope of the glory of God. And so you get this, this pattern this, uh, of three here that appears um, in these praises element as part of, uh, uh, as part of this, this poem. And this poem kind of deals with the first three stages. You won't be able to see the words here, but you can see the kind of chunks from verse 3 to 6, uh, 7 to 12, 13 to 14. So blessings um, of God um, um, and calling of the believers is in that first section. And they are called in Christ. We have redemption, forgiveness of sins and inheritance. And the last section talks about having accepted the gospel, you're sealed with the Spirit. You're sealed with the Spirit. And there's this... There's this idea uh, in that last section of, of being purchased. So that it, it says um, sealed, and that word sealed is linked with the idea of being purchased. Um, it's it's um, uh, the idea of, of um, being owned and being uh, purchased. And then we have this idea reiterated in the next verse, which is a purchased possession, a redemption of the purchased possession. And so we see this idea countless times uh, within, within Scripture. There's this one in, uh, in John 6, um, which we won't look at, but in, in John 3, we'll look at this one, and it talks um, here about our mind being changed and in doing so being sealed. So we have this idea of a change of mind and being sealed, um, being purchased. So in John chapter 3, and verse 33... Um, um, he that received his testimony, it was the testimony of, of Jesus, or it's just the testimony of John, actually. Uh, who, whoever received that testimony um, hath set his seal that God is true. It's been sealed and had this, this, this idea of being owned, and in doing so is, is, is saying that God is true. Um, and then we have this idea of, of, of being bought with a price that we see in 1 Corinthians chapter 7. So having accepted this gospel and being sealed, we are es essentially uh, being purchased with this idea of being purchased. And, and our mind now has the mark, um, the mark that we have been redeemed. It, we, we have been redeemed. 
Now, what does that then mean for us? How does our mind then work? It should work differently. And that's the second aspect that we have here in, in Ephesians, which is something to do with the heavenlies. Now, we see the heavenlies in a number of different places. We have it in these five, five places within um, Ephesians. We also have some other references which link to them that I've put on the side here. Um, two of them are of great inter, um, interest to us in this context. Um, so heaven is, is really talking about... Um, uh, well, let's have, let's have a look at the two of them. So we have verse 3 of chapter 1. Blessed be... This is the fir- opening of this poem... Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who hath blessed us um, with all spiritual blessings in heavenly places in Christ. Something to do with being in Christ and heavenly places, or heavenlies, as that the word places there, as you'll see, is in italics in the AV. So it's the word heavenlies. Um, and we see it again uh, in chapter 2 and verse 6. This is the effect of being baptised, raised up together and made us to sit together in heavenly places in Christ Jesus. And so doing a full study of this um, would would take uh, our our entire evening. However, it's interesting that this is a situation that exists today. Like you've been baptised and he's raised us up together to sit uh, together in heavenly places. Um, There is an idea, um, if you look at these other verses... uh, to be um, to do with uh, people in power and authority, and it also links with ideas in, in Colossians as well. There's a strong correlation between these ideas that we see in Ephesians here and what we see in, in, in the letter to um, the Colossians. Um, but it's really those that have been baptised, those that have been sealed, um, are essentially um, saying that they are looking to something different. They're looking, they're, they're, they're elevating their minds to things heavenly, towards heavenlies, the heavenlies, to things pertaining to God, is essentially what this, this idea is saying. So your mind has been renewed, it's had the effect of the spirit word on it, and in doing so it's been sealed, you've been purchased, and as a result of that you're living your life looking to things pertaining to heaven. Um, and let's just have a look at um, 1 Corinthians um, 15, um, just to see um, the end result of that. And, I, and um, Brother David very insightfully um, mentioned this in his, his prayer at the beginning, talking about spiritual bodies that are, are, they, are the uh, reward for the faithful. And it's, it's, it's again, we have this um, very simple putting side by side the natural and the fleshly and the spiritual within 1 Corinthians 15. 1 Corinthians 15, verse 45. So as it is written, the first man, Adam, was made a living soul, and the last man, Adam, was made a quickening spirit. And so even though we've got the actions of the spirit here, we've got the actions of of God breathing into the nostrils, uh, the angel, this breath going into the nostrils, and the breath of life, we have that put side by side with the quickening spirit, this life-giving spirit. Um, and so uh, putting into the minds the, the word of God that can, that can provide this everlasting life. Um, so we see, um, how be it, uh, verse 46, that was not first which was spiritual, but that which was natural, and afterward that which was spiritual. The first man is of the earth, earthy, and the second man is of the Lord from heaven. As it is earthy, such are they that are, of, uh, that are earthy. And as uh, is the heavenly, such are they also that are heavenly. And as we have borne the image of the earthy, we shall also bear the image of the heavenly. And so there's this idea then of, of yes, we're coming from a place of being earthly and natural. However, we want to have this life-giving spirit blow through our minds and have us looking to things heavenly. We don't have it at the moment. We, we've not attained it. We've not been given it yet, uh, the, the, the result, this spiritual body. But that's the thing that we're looking towards. That's the thing that we're headed towards. And that's the thing that the Ephesians are told to look towards, the things heavenlies. 
Yeah, so, so the things um, heavenly. So let's go back to, to Ephesians and look at our last aspect before we conclude. So the last aspect we said was the idea of being filled. And again, this idea um, of being filled is something that repeats. If you look at the, um, th- this idea of being filled, it crops up all over the place uh, within Ephesians. So we see it in Ephesians 1, verses 10. Um, so we see here, uh, where do we see that? Yes, yeah, so uh, that is the dispensation of the fullness of the times. And we see it in verse 23, um, that it, it, which is his body, the fullness of him that filleth all in all. We see it in chapter 3 and verse 19, um, um, that ye may be filled with all the fullness of God. And we see it in chapter 4, verses 10 and 13. So descended up, um, uh, or is it descended, is the same that ascended up far above all heavens, um, that he might fill all things. And verse um, 13 as well. So we see this idea of fullness or being filled, and again, it links with the same ideas that we see within, within Colossians. Now, what does this word mean? This is the word, again, I'm no scholar, but it's the word pleru. Um, and this, this is a word which means um, um, to, to make replete or to, to cram or to level up, to, to, to complete uh, so there's this, this idea, and we see the same idea um, linked with um, the Spirit in Acts chapter 1. So remember when they were promised this, um, the, the, the Spirit gifts, uh, this idea of, of being um, complete or being um, filled comes when the Spirit is given to them. So when they're up in, the, in that upper room, um, they're in the upper room and the, and the, uh, the, the wind Mighty wind blows through, and, it, and what does it do? Well, first of all, it fills, filled all the house, and they were sitting, and they appeared unto them cloven tongues, which were a fire, and it sat on each of them, and they were all filled with the Holy Spirit. So they are slightly different words. So ver- in verse 2, I think, it's the, I think the verse 2 is the same one that we will see um, in, in, in Ephesians. Uh, but they have this, so the one in verse 2 has this idea of, being replete, crammed, and, and covered, so it's like a baptism. Um, and this word in, in chapter, in verse 4, is to fill, um, uh, um, in, that, that, that we see in that chapter. So we have it linked with the spirit gifts, but it goes way beyond the spirit gifts, because we see um, this idea of, of, of this filling, completing the work of God, completing and being, um, as we see in Ephesians 1 verse um, 20, um, being filleth all in all. And we get the same ideas in 1 Corinthians uh, 15, all in all. And so it links towards the, per- the final purpose and the completing of the purpose um, of God. And this completeness that we see again uh, um, repeated within Ephesians. So in Ephesians um, 4 verses 9 to 13, we have all these ideas which talk about being complete and perfected, etc. So from, if you scan down um, um, chapter 9, uh, sorry, chapter 3, 4, verse 9 um, down, you see the idea of being fill all, perfecting, unity, the perfect man, the stature and fullness of Christ. And so we see this idea of giving the creation of God the purpose it was designed for, the purpose that God designed for it, um, to give glory to God. So we see again in that, in that quote from Isaiah that the earth was formed um, and he established it. He formed it, not, um, he formed it not in vain, he formed it to be inhabited. And so we see that in the idea of creation, the, the reason for creation was for it to be inhabited, for it to be completed, to be, to be finished, and to give glory glory um, to God. And so we see a pattern then, don't we, in this idea of the Spirit, this creating in the mind of these, uh, these believers um, a, a group of people who are looking to things heavenly, looking towards the complete purpose um, of, of God. And these people are no longer sort of looking at the drudgery of those things around them, but are looking to things heavenly, have their eyes 
um, looked um, um, and looking upwards. So that really kind of brings to a conclusion that, that the study that I was I I went through when I was looking at this at this um, uh, this idea of of uh, being renewed in the spirit of your mind taken from Ephesians four. Um, so just to summarise those those three points, we. We see that the word of God and this, you know, the spirit word uh, that we see in this, this um, that hand of the, of the soldier in, in, in chapter six, the word of God, the spirit word, it works on man. It renews the mind of man and removes the, the old man and it fills it with a spiritual message, a, a message. And in doing so, it redeems and purchases and seals them. Um, and in doing that, they are looked, looking um, heavenly. They're looking to things um, heavenly. So we can take this message that was given to the Ephesians all those, all those years ago, and we can apply it to our own minds as well, can't we? We can apply this same idea, this same um, complete changing of, of approach to our own minds, and, and many of us have done that. We need to continue um, doing that. The work of the word of God, the spirit word, continues to work on our mind, to renew our minds and to, um, to create um, in us a clean um, heart. So let's just conclude then maybe with a passage um, in Ephesians. And if you remember, sorry, not Ephesians, in, in uh, Philippians. And uh, we, re- we read um, a, a verse in Philippians that says, Let this mind be in you, which was also in Christ Jesus.